Well, before I begin today, I just also want to comment on how good it was to start gathering again as a church at our outdoor services last Sunday morning. It was a little different. We had masks and we were being careful to distance, but how good it was to see people from our Mill Creek campus, from our South Street campus, from our Kessinger campus gathered together as one Chapel Street church family just to worship. It was so good. We're going to do it again this coming Sunday, 9 and 1030. But if you're not quite comfortable with that yet, you can always watch our online service. We're going to record one right here in this room, put it on at 9 and 1030 next Sunday morning so you can watch in your own home. But thank you for being part of our church family. Okay, what do the following three movies or TV shows have in common? Number one, the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. You know, the heartwarming tale of George Bailey who gets into financial trouble, despairs of his own life, and then is rescued by a curiously humble-looking angel named Clarence who gets his wings. Number two, the family comedy Angels in the Outfield, which tells the story of a boy who desperately wants his favorite baseball team, named the Angels, to win the pennant, but they need help. And they need help from uh, some former ball players who are now heavenly angels. Number three, the 1980s sitcom Teen Angel, which I sincerely hope none of you actually watched when it was on, but it tells a story where a young man's recently deceased best friend comes back as his guardian angel. So what do these three have in common? Well, angels, of course, but if we're paying attention, there's something else. The so-called angels in these shows are really people who have died and then come back, return in the form of angels. Now, it's this widespread cultural mythology about angels that leads us to the topic we look at today. We're in a summer-long series called, Did God Say That? And we're looking at these sayings or things people say uh, that sound like something God would say. They sound like they might be in the Bible, but upon further review and study, they turn out to be somewhat twisted versions of something else that God said in his word. So far, we've covered sayings like, everything happens for a reason. People are basically good. God will never give you more than you can handle. Just let go and let God. And last week, Jeff spoke about just be true to yourself. Now, if you missed any of those messages or are curious about how we handled them, you can always go back and listen to them, and I encourage you to do that on our website or on our YouTube channel. Now, today, the the saying we look at is a hard one, because usually when we either say it or hear it, it's a time of great personal loss and pain. And here it is. God must have needed another angel in heaven. God must have needed another angel in heaven. Now, this is something we say or we hear when someone dies, especially when a young person or a child dies. Here's the setting. A child dies either by tragic accident or maybe terminal illness, and a well-intentioned friend attends the memorial service or the visitation, and they wait through the line to offer condolences and comfort to the grieving family. And when their time comes, they just don't know what to say. And wanting to say something that brings comfort, they say, Well, God must have needed another angel in heaven. And in some ways, I understand. I get it. We want to help. We want to say something nice. We want to ease the pain, if just a little bit. And we do believe, after all, that if an infant or a young person dies, they are free from pain. They are free from suffering. In the book of Revelation, heaven is described like this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. We do believe that the departed one is in the presence of God in a way we can scarcely imagine. So we are tempted to picture them as safe and happy in the presence of God with wings and halos and sitting on clouds strumming harps. We picture them as angels. So, what's so wrong with that? Well, here's my brief summary. Good intentions, but bad theology. I'm going to talk to you today about two problems and a promise. Problem one, God doesn't need any more angels. Problem one is God doesn't need any more angels. At our house, in our neighborhood, Wednesday is garbage day. 
So on Wednesday morning, the garbage trucks come and they pick up your cans, but we need to put a sticker on those cans. And this past Wednesday morning, I was uh, studying and working on actually this sermon. And I remembered it was garbage day, so I went into the kitchen to that drawer where you keep stuff like this, and I, I went to find our garbage stickers, but we had no garbage stickers. And without the garbage stickers, they won't pick up our garbage, so I had to get in my car at 6.15 in the morning, drive to the local jewel store, and pick up the garbage stickers I needed. And I would guess that all of you watching this have done something like that at one time or another. You know, you need milk, or you need eggs, or you need double fudge, chocolate moose tracks, ice cream, Whatever. So you jump in your car and you run out and you go to Walmart or Target or Jewel and you get what you need. But here's the problem. God doesn't need any more angels. In fact, God doesn't need anything. To suggest that someone died, especially a child, because God needed another angel in heaven is to imply either that God in all his infinite wisdom and all his knowledge and power failed to create enough angels in the first place. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when or how the angels were created. If you go back to the book of Job, uh, perhaps the oldest part of the entire Bible, we read this passage in Job 38. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? This is God speaking to Job. Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Now that passage seems to say that the angels of heaven were either included in or preceded the creation event of Genesis chapter 1. So, did God create 100,000 angels at the beginning of all things and then later sort of realize he needed more like 200,000? Or did God somehow run out of angels and needed to run to the store and pick some up? See, to say God must have needed another angel portrays a God who treats earth and human life like a local jewel store where he can run in anytime he wants and take people from their loved ones because he needed them. As well-intentioned as we might be, when we say things like this, we do three things, I think. First, we make God look petty and cruel. In the book of Job, uh, man, the man named Job se- suffers a series of devastating losses. His, his uh, wealth, his family, his physical health, His friends hear about it. They come to his side, which is a good thing. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But then they start trying to explain to Job why he is suffering. They start saying to him, well, Job, you must have done something to offend God. You must have sinned some way. You must have done something to deserve this pain and suffering. They just assume God must be punishing Job. But when God finally speaks at the end of the book, he confronts these friends and he confronts them In anger. Job 42, we read. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. To say God needed another angel in heaven is to speak that which is not right about God. Secondly, when we say things like this, we deny our friends the privilege and the right to grieve. We were created in the image of God. We were created to love one another, and when we lose one we love, we grieve. It's just how we're made. And in this way, grief is good because grief honors love. But how can you grieve? How can you even begin to grieve if God needed your loved one? Thirdly, when we say things like this, we create a distorted image of God. And therefore, even if unintentionally, we push people further away from God, because how can they come to trust and love a God who treats their loved ones like a gallon of milk at Walmart? First problem is God doesn't need another angel in heaven. Second problem is people don't become angels. People don't become angels angels. Anyone out there remember another bad TV show from the 80s called Highway to Heaven? Anyone? 
the actor Michael Landon, yep, that Michael Landon from Bonanza and Little House on the Prairie. He played a character who's died and is sent back to earth as an angel, an angel with really great hair, by the way, to help people in need. That show ran for five full seasons, 111 episodes. Evidently, Mr. Landon had lots of people to help. But this is a very common misperception uh, in our culture, even among those of us who believe the Bible to be the word of God. But the idea that loved ones who die become angels in heaven and then even watch over us from heaven or return to visit us and protect us as angels is absolutely foreign to the Bible. So let me just say it clearly. People do not become angels. Angels were created by God in a specific way for a specific purpose. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Human beings were also created by God in a specific way for a specific purpose. Now, angels and people do have some similarities. For example, both are created with intelligence and emotion and will and are meant to worship and serve God for all eternity, but they are not created equal. Speaking of human beings, Psalm 8 says, You have made them, that is us people, human beings, a little lower than the angels or heavenly beings and crowned them with glory and honor. So the psalm writer clearly differentiates between angels and human beings. Angels were created as spiritual, supernatural beings who do the will of God. And they have two main tasks throughout Scripture. First, they worship endlessly around the throne of God. Revelation chapter 7 says, and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. So the angels serve God by worshiping him endlessly. And they are also, secondly, messengers. In fact, the word angel in both the Hebrew and Greek means messenger. And throughout the Bible, we see angels used by God as messengers sent to serve or deliver messages to human beings. Let me give you a few examples. In Daniel chapters 8 and 9, the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel to help explain his dreams and visions. In Matthew chapter 4, angels come to minister to Jesus after his temptation by Satan in the wilderness. In Acts chapter 12, an angel helps Peter escape from prison. In Luke 2, angels, a whole chorus of them, bring the great announcement of the birth of the Messiah, the Christ, to the shepherds out in the fields. And most famously, perhaps in Luke chapter 24, when the women go to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body for burial, they find the stone rolled away. And greeting them are angels who announce the great news that Jesus is risen. That's angels. That's what they do. That's why they were created. But the Bible describes human beings differently. It tells us that human beings were created in the image of God. It does not say that about angels. We were created for a unique relationship with God, to be sons and daughters, heirs with Christ. Angels are not described that way. We were redeemed from our sin by the very blood of the Son of God. We are never told in Scripture that angels are redeemed. In fact, when the Apostle Peter is trying to describe how the prophets look forward to the coming of the promised one, the Messiah, he writes this in 1 Peter chapter 1. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then notice this. Even angels long to look into these things. Now this is a very mysterious thing for Peter to say. What does he mean? A Renaissance painter named Tintoretto created a beautiful version of the Last Supper. And as you look at this painting, you see Jesus at the table serving bread and cup to the disciples. But if you look just above the table and you can make it out, the artist has depicted angels sort of hovering over the table. They're straining to watch what's happening down on the table with great curiosity and longing as if they marvel at what God is doing, as if they're saying, look, look how he loves them. Hebrews chapter 1, the writer says, To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? 
Now notice here that scripture is telling us that although we were created a little lower than the heavenly beings, <coughs> excuse me, a little lower than the angels, our destiny in Christ is to be even more than the angels. Listen to Revelation 20. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over the such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. You see that? Priests of God reigning with Christ. Angels were created to serve and worship God and they do. You and I, we were created and redeemed to reign with Jesus. A writer named Chad Bird, who I'd never read before, says it beautifully in this paragraph. He writes, Now let's imagine for a moment that our loved ones do become angels when they die. What an everlasting disappointment that would be. No longer would they be humans with whom Jesus shares the intimate bond of flesh and blood. No longer would they be those who reign with him. No longer would they be kings and queens created in the image and likeness of God. No longer could they say, Christ died for me. It is therefore the best of news that when Christians die, heaven does not get another angel. We cannot become angels any more than we can become giraffes or ocean waves or stars. We are people, and we will remain so after this present life. God did not make a mistake when he made us human. No, people do not become angels when they die. We become something far more, and that's because we have a promise. And that's the third thing I want to talk about today, a promise. One of Jesus' most well-known stories in the New Testament is called the parable of the prodigal son. Now, the story's not directly about heaven or angels, but I think it's instructive for us on this topic. You know the story. A father has two sons. The younger of the sons demands his inheritance early, goes out and spends it all in wild living, winds up in the far country feeding pigs. He eventually comes to his senses and decides to go back home to his father and beg just to be taken back as a hired servant, a slave. But as he heads home, he finds his father waiting for him. And his father receives him not with judgment and punishment, but rather with grace and joy. He puts a ring on his finger and a sandals on his feet and a robe on his back, and he receives him not as a slave, not as a servant, but as a son. And here's the promise. Our destiny in Christ is not to be hired servants or slaves, even though we will serve him. Our destiny is not to be angels who worship around the throne, although we will worship him. Our destiny is to be sons and daughters who inherit his inheritance and reign with him. We will be made more, even greater, than the angels of heaven. Two things we need to know. First, death, physical death, is universal. We don't know when or how it comes, but death is inevitable and touches us all. The Bible calls death the final enemy to be put under Jesus' feet. And when a loved one dies, we grieve. We grieve. But the second thing we need to know is that we have a hope. Our hope is resurrection life. The Apostle Paul speaks of this life, this hope, In Romans chapter 8, he says, For consider that the sufferings, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Verse 24, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now, we also need to know here that our resurrection life does not make us angels. We've already talked about that. It doesn't even make us equal angels. It makes us more than angels. Paul again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? If you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? And in this sentence, do you not know that we will judge the angels? Again, a paragraph from Chad Bird. When believers die in Christ, 
we will go to be with our Lord in paradise and to await the time when he will return with us to establish the new heavens and the new earth, raise the dead, and give us renewed and glorified bodies. Then we will live and rejoice in the new creation that will have no end to the everlasting joy of the ministering angels around the throne. So, we never need say, nor should we say, God must have needed another angel in heaven. First, because it's not true. Second, because it's not helpful. So what then do we say? What do we say to those we love who have suffered a crushing loss? Well, let me just suggest a couple of things today. First, say nothing. Say nothing, but do something. In the story of Job, when his friends hear about his suffering, they travel a great distance just to be with their friend. In Job 2, we read, And they sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. They didn't say anything at first. But they did do something. They went to be with their friend and they stayed with their friend and they ministered to him with their presence and their compassion, not with their words. And when you need to speak, consider something simple like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I can't imagine the pain you're going through. Notice, not I know what you're going through, not because, you know, I I lost a grandfather once or I lost my grandmother, I lost a dog once, I know what you're going through. No, 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 no. Never start with I know. Because everyone deserves the dignity of their own pain. All loss and all pain is personal and unique. That's why I believe one of the most helpful verses in the Bible is also the shortest. John 11, 35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The situation was his friend Lazarus had died. Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, are grieving. And the first thing Jesus does when he sees the tomb of his friend is to weep with them and to weep for them. He doesn't explain why Lazarus has died. He doesn't explain why God allowed this to happen. He doesn't try to explain why he waited several days before going to their aid. He just grieves with them. And then he explains who he is. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So when we face the wrenching pain of loss, our loss or someone else's loss, We don't need to resort to some syrupy platitude to try to make things better. We don't need to try to explain why someone has died. We don't need to try to explain why someone is sick. We don't need to try to to explain God's reasons uh, or God's purpose. We don't have to try to take away the pain or make someone feel better. We simply weep with those who weep. Because the truth is, we don't know why from our human perspective. We don't know why awful, terrible things happen. We don't fully understand why death comes when it does and how it does. But we do know who we trust. We know who. And we know what he has promised to us. The redemption of our bodies, because we've been purchased as his sons and daughters. Resurrection life and that we will reign with him forever. So, we go to those who grieve. We go to them, and we stay with them, and we weep with them, and we grieve with them, and we hold on to them. But we also hold on to the promise of Jesus. You bow with me as I finish Lord Jesus, we thank you for the promise of your word. We do live in a broken and fallen world where suffering and death eventually touch each one of us. So thank you for not leaving us to face these things alone. 
Thank you for not leaving us to conjure empty platitudes to find false comfort. Thank you for both the privilege of grief and the great promise of redemption and resurrection life. Thank you for the promises upon which even angels long to look. In your name we pray. Amen.